Good day. Continue into the discussion or discussion. I have several areas that I would like to focus on. Um, I had picked out a few areas in each section because it's such a huge uh, information. So I'd like to show you what's going on now or what has been going on for the past 15, 20 years and now. So next. Uh, okay, outline of the discussion, as I stated, the Indigenous History, Residential School, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I will discuss a few of these um, and show you some slides and also a, um, a video, two minute video on the Truth and Reconciliation. Okay, Indigenous History. So what I'm gonna do is randomly pick some stuff out rather than reading the whole material. Uh, as you can see, you can read it yourself, but uh, the important points that I wanted to bring up. Uh, January the 1st, 1500, Indigenous population ranges from 200,000 to 500,000 estimates for the population range though some suggest it was as high as 2.5 million in between 300 to 450 spoken languages. Um, in 1600, the diseases devastated indigenous populations, chirp, TB, smallpox, and measles spread intentionally or inadvertently across North America, devastating indigenous populations. Again, in June 2, June 2nd, 1539, the Pope's proclamation of Aboriginal people. January the 1st, 1600, trade alliance between indigenous people and Europeans from indigenous technology and knowledge of hunting, trapping, guiding food and diseases proved crucial to the survival of East of Europeans and early colonial economy and society. Okay, so I'll be going, bouncing around in each slide to express or read. Okay, how do I switch to the next slide? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, the next is January the 1st, 1613, self-government. The government chain agreements established the two row wampum. And this is with the, Confeder the Confederacy and the European representatives. They agreed to work together, peace as well as economic, political, and cultural sovereignty, gift exchange, honors, promises, and new alliances. This is what we, or they, or us, all based on in the right from the beginning before um christopher and everybody else that came in I shouldn't say everybody else but christopher when we developed this and which is still being used um january the first 1615 european missionaries arrived in north america the first european mission missionaries and later arrived to convert indigenous populations to catholicism May 2nd, 1670, Hudson's Bay Company is established, forming monopoly and increasing the volume of goods in the fur trade. For centuries to come, blankets are widely traded, including the, the iconic HBC point blanket. I didn't have a picture for that, but yeah. Um, 17, May 1st. 1756, seven wars began. The seven wars, the first global war fought in Europe, India, America, and sea. The North American Britain, supremacy with the Treaty of Paris, France, former cities, Canada to the British. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay. Uh, 
May 16, 2014, National Operational Review of Missing and Murdered Aboriginal Women. The RCMP released the National Operational Review on Missing and Murdered Aboriginal Women. Research identified 1,181 missing and murdered Aboriginal women in Canadian police databases. 164 missing dating back to 1952 and 1,017 murdered between 1980 and 2012. This number is changing. It's increasing and they're finding more. Um, so this is ongoing. There's a huge um, web page on its own. That could be an interesting topic uh, the next time. The summary report. Here's the red dress, murder dress. Report of the December 15, 2015, the final report of the Truth Reconciliation Commission released the truth. Reconciling for the future, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who attended the ceremony, released the report commits commits his government to implementing all of the 94 recommendations set out in the June 2015 summary report. This is still on hold. Um, uh, there's areas there that were touched, but not as he promised will implement. It's still, it's still put behind. Behind. Okay, the other one is uh, February 14, 2017, first victory of the 60 Scoops lawsuit, Ontario Supreme Court Justice ruled in favor of the 60 Scoop victims, finding that the federal government did not take adequate steps to protect the cultural identity of unreserved children taken away from their homes. This was the first victory of the 60 Scoop lawsuit in Canada. Again, this is still ongoing and they're still finding more. And there's another huge uh, website, web page on this too, some information. Okay, next page. The death, okay, March 10th, 2017, the death of Richard Wagamis. Anishinaabe Ojibwe novelist and journalist Richard died in Kamloops, BC at the age of 61. A member of the Wabasamog Independent Nations was taken from his family as a young child during the 60s scoop and only reunited with him as an adult. The experience informed his exploration of his Anishinaabe roots in his writing. He published more than a dozen works in his lifetime, in addition to Penman a popular Indigenous Affairs column and working in broadcasting. Again, if you type up his name, you'll see a lot of his materials there and great stories and great history he's providing. Um, okay, July 26, 2017, Supreme Court rules of pipeline projects. The Supreme Court of Canada ruled that Indigenous people do not have the power to veto resource development projects such as pipelines. It stated that while the government has a duty to result, to consult the indigenous communities, the National Energy Board, NEB, is the final decision maker. This is mind blowing, continuing right now. You see it all over the news. This is ongoing. The promises that we're giving and are taking to the Chippewas of the time, Times, First Nation, and appeal the NEB's approval of the modification to Emberge Line 9 pipeline, which runs through traditional Chippewa territory near London, Ontario. Again, this is all over the news, so you'll find more of those. Another great topic on its own. Next. Slide. August 28th, the federal government pledges a scrap of the Indian Act. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announces the Division of Indigenous, Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada into two departments, naming Jane Minister Indigenous Service and Carol Minister of the Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs. Um, the recommendation is to replace INAC with two departments originally made in 1966 to the Royal Commission of Aboriginal People. Again, the, this goes back, if you go back in history and follow more in the news, um, the Indigenous people are fighting for this and they're still taking it and still breaking it down into their own government into two more, three more pieces. Um, OK, 
Hurricane October the 5th, 2017 Energy East Pipeline project to cancel. TransCan announced that it had canceled plans to build the Energy East Pipeline, which would have carried crude oil from Alberta and Saskatchewan to the refineries in Quebec and New Brunswick. From there, oil would have been explored to other countries. Again, this whole idea of building pipes underneath the ground would have destroyed all the life all the animals and water and um, growth that uh, the traditional people have lived off the land. Uh, once, and we've seen this many times where all the um, pipes have been broken and in the waters and they're still cleaning and clearing and finding dead animals and birds and fish. So it's not a good thing. Um, next. October the 6th, 2017, 60 Scoop survivors received settlement. The federal government announced to settle 1,800 million with 60 Scoop survivors. The 60 Scoop refers to their forced removal of Indigenous children from their homes and their subsequent adoption into prominently non-Indigenous middle-class families across Canada and the United States in the 1960s. Survivors of these federal and provincial government policies experienced lasting trauma as a result of the separation from their birth families, communities, and cultures. This explains it all. Um, <clears throat> Justin Trudeau, November 24th, 2017, issues of Newfoundland and Labrador Residential School apology. Prime Minister Justin apologized to the survivors of the residential schools in Newfoundland and Labrador who were excluded from Stephen Harper's because residential schools were not run by the federal government and were established before Newfoundland joined Confederation 1949. This is um, still finding again, it's ongoing. They're still finding more information. They're still building. It's, um, it's sad to see, to hear, to read how it's been all ignored for so many generations. Um, Okay, next slide. Mm. The final report, June 3rd, 20, 2019, the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls released the final murdered Indigenous woman re reveals that persistent and deliberate human rights violations are the source of Canada's staggering rates of violence against Indigenous women, girls, and LGBTQ2S people. The report gives 231 calls for justice to government policies, forces, and institutions. Again, this is ongoing, and this is building. There's more added. There's more people supporting and, and um, asking for more um, help into revealing um, what is going on and how is it happening to these women? Why is it happening? Where is it happening? So yes. Um, Bill S3, August 15th, the remaining part, B, Bill S3 was created in response to the Deschino case in 2015 which is about a gender discrimination in Indian Act. The first part of the bill came into effect on December 22nd, 2017. Among other provisions, the amendment enables more people to pass down Indian status to their descendants. Again, this has been ongoing since uh, we were established as First Nations. Uh, our status card, when our status card was given, if you were not in line back when this was taken, uh, you were exempted from that. You were no longer uh, an Indigenous or an Aboriginal person if you were not signed up in their uh, status, in, uh, Indian status. Um, so your their family or their generation or family name wouldn't be put into that system, so they wouldn't recognize them as being Indigenous. Therefore, they wouldn't. Uh, they weren't allowed to do or apply or to. Uh, gain any kind of um, land or hunting rights, fishing rights, trapping rights. So with this Indian status, it, you have exempt, they have exemption dates on this card. Another 
this would be a great topic again to discuss on its own. Um, they have a, a card that has uh, expiry dates to it. So every four years, I believe, we have to uh, go into our First Nations uh, um, uh, where we're born and do the whole thing, fill the forms out, the government forms, take a picture, send it out. They verify that, yeah, okay, you know, this is good, where she's a native, she's an Indian, she's an indigenous woman, yeah, okay, so it comes back to us, and we have this card that we're allowed to use, so to prove that we are indigenous um, with these benefits that are apparently supposed to make us better. Um, again, that's a great topic on its own. Okay, next. Um, Canada Day, yeah, this is another big one. Um, because it's Canada Day tomorrow, um, a lot of Indigenous people uh, do not celebrate Canada Day because of the history of what it meant. What it means to us is that our land was taken from us and broken down into provinces. And we had no say, no vote, no discussion about it. It was just taken from us. And um, so, no. And there's a big history onto this. Again, there's a big uh, uh, story of the actual dinner and so forth. So, again, this would be another good topic on its own. The Confederation was uh, accomplished by the Queen, gave royal... Uh, sent to the British North America BNA Act on March 29, 1860. Stating, we do ordain, declare, and command that on and after the first day of July, 1867, the provinces of Canada, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick shall form and be one domain, dominant, dominant, dominant. Under the name of Canada, the, that act which united the province of Canada with the colonies of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, came into effect July 1st that year. The act replaced the Act of Union 1840, which had unified Upper Canada and Lower Canada into the United Province of Canada. Separated, separate provinces were reestablished under their current names of Ontario and Quebec. July 1st is now celebrated as a public holiday candidate to the to the country's official national day. Why we shouldn't celebrate Canada? Uh, you probably shouldn't celebrate Canada with dream catchers. Uh, a quote from McKean points out that not many indigenous people are celebrating Canada because it is a reminder of years of colonial oppression and broken treaties. We are not celebrating Canada. We're celebrating 150 years of stolen land. So, Yes, that whole area is a good discussion again on its own because it has different acts and history that we can explain more. Okay, next slide. Residential school. Okay, um, this is very, very uh, sensitive to a lot of people, Indigenous elders. Um, and their generation, next generation, their children, grandchildren. So I'm not going to go too deep in this. Again, this is one huge area on its own. Um, there's some pictures I wanted you to bring up. I'm going to show. Um, I wanted to discuss some of the stuff that's not in we don't see this in, in our history books. We don't see this in our social work history and materials. We don't even see this in university materials. So some of the materials that I'm reading or presenting, um, it's new to some and some have never heard of or were not known of. So the purpose of the residential school is to civilize and Christianize indigenous children. Our great grandparents and grandparents were forced to live in these home schools as young as five years old. Some were born in the schools through their through young girls who were sexually abused by the priests. This area is too hard to share, but I'll share some uh, pictures and uh, stories. While they were living in residence school, the boys and girls were sexually abused by the nuns and priests. The children were forced to speak English and punished if caught speaking Cree. Many of the children suffered physical, psychological, spiritual abuse and affected their lives forever. 
to health problems, substance abuse, suicide rates, and criminal activity. The effects are passed on to the children that went on for generations. The intergenerational effects are still seen to this day in the First Nations and communities. They are robbed of their innocence. How can they give love when this was never given to them as a child? I've attached a link for Hidden from History, the Canadian Hope. The Canadian Holocaust, the untold story of the genocide of Aboriginal peoples by church and state in Canada, a summary of an ongoing independent inquiry into Canadian native residentials and their legacy. Um, I'm going to see if I can click on to this. If I can't, you can look at it your, on your own, but um, this information is an independent research. people that have worked in these areas have kept their own records and uh, um, it's pretty detailed uh, again it's pretty sensitive too so oh, okay um, let's go to the next so one of the stories I wanted to make sure that was noted also is that during the residential schools um, they've experienced, the um, Indigenous children had experienced schools like schools, electric chair haunts natives. And um, first it was used for entertainment and then punished for Aboriginal children. This is good uh, with, uh, material that I wanted to uh, read for you. Um, this was given to... This was in, this First Nation was in Fort Albany First Nation and they're discussing St. Anne's Residential School. Um, a gentleman named Edmund Matatawaban, who was also a previous chief uh, in that area, has also written many and many of materials or books uh, regarding his experience. And one of the latest ones that I pulled up and I didn't have a chance to add it to it, but again, it's an, another addition to this I can add on to. But his book was Edmund, Edmund Matatawaban, Up Ghost River, A Chief's Journey Through Turbulent Waters of Native History. This is a current book that he just wrote. And another material that I wanted to provide, but again, it's a little hard, it's a CD. It's called Muffins for Granny. And this is stories from survivors of the Canadian residential school system. And this is dated 2007. Again, I think you can access it out there in a system. Um, reading this briefly, the homemade electric chair that was used for years of punishing Aboriginal children at St. Mary's Residential School has disappeared. Not its memory endures. Hundreds of children who survived the horrors of the school had bitter memories of the chair that was used first for entertainment, but eventually as a means as a means of forcing them to bend to the will of the Roman Catholic missionaries who ran the school. People were put in the electric chair as a form of punishment. Marianne Nakachi Davies, who was 41, who attended St. Anne's between grade one and eight, said in an interview, they would put children in it if they were bad, but nuns used it as a weapon. It was done to me on more than one occasion. They would strap your arms in a metal arm rest and it would jolt you and go through your system. I don't know how, and I did, I don't know what I did that was bad enough to have that done to me. And again, Edmund Matatawaban, former chief, Fort Albany First Nation, also has his stories, and I just mentioned his books. Please look at him, find him up on the uh, online, you'll see his materials. Next. I just added some pictures here on different uh, First Nations. Uh, forced uh, abortions and secret burials. Uh, Catholic, ceremony. Catholic Cemetery West of Port Albany, Albany, across from residential school where children were buried in secret. This is another area of the history that's not put into our uh, materials in schools, university or colleges, or even in high school. So there's a lot of material out there in this and uh, it's slowly being allowed to be released and taught and brought in 
as workshops through our elders and through the communities. Next. Forced abortions and secret bearers. West Coast General Hospital, where forced abortions were performed by Native students made pregnant by the Alberni residential school staff and where dead bodies from the school were stored under false death certificates. Again, this whole area is a huge area to uh, review and um, I just wanted to make sure that this is out there because we don't read this, we don't see this, we're not taught this part of our Indigenous history. Next. <clears throat> um, state of killing since the burial sites. Yes, again, um, looking west of the school site into the hills, and numerous children reported to be buried. Yeah, there are stories about that. Um, a lot of them out west and uh, further north of um, James Bay. Next. Site of killings and secret burial sites. Again, the spot where Henry Ross discovered a young body, young girl's body, dead body in May 1967 above the underground chamber of the former school where children's bodies were stored. Uh, there are stories, yes, of again, um, foster homes, uh, residential homes. Yes, um, again, this is added to the history. There's more information on this. Okay, next. A map of the former school indicating where dead bodies of children were buried. Yeah. Okay, next. Gathers Mark, School's Grim, Litany of Death, uh, Babies Buried Under Apple Tree. A long table held the names of hundreds of children who died at Cooper, Cooper, Cooper Island School from disease, from accidents, and from suspicious causes. Several former students have told her the same stories. Babies were buried under the apple tree, born to the girls who have been sexually abused by priests. It's not just sexual abuse, but wrongful death. We want police to look at. From 1890, 1890 to 1975, the Mount Ford Catholic Orders Last June, Brother Glenn Daughtry was convicted of sexual abuse. Three boys in the 60s, RCMPs are probing other sexual abuse disclosures. Um, there's cases this is going on, still going on, still researching. Um, closure is all we all see. Next. Okay, a former student. Bill Seward, whose sister Margaret was thrown from a third story window by a nun and died. Next. Mabel and William Sport, witness to the murder of infecting of students with tuberculosis at the Christie and Alberni UC school. Next. So the United Church Sterilization Center. This is another uh, big topic uh, area of discussion for First Nations, uh, residential schools, uh, where they were using experimenting drugs, experimenting medicine on the uh, children. Medical experiments between 1923 to 1969. And there is uh, stories or um, stories of people that have been through this in that one section I told you in the past. Um, 
in the beginning there we had to log in but I couldn't get in but it, this is a huge section of its own that, that could be viewed too. Oops. Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Okay. The Truth and Reconciliation. A mandate to learn the truth about the happening residential schools. To inform all Canadians of what happened at the schools. The commission to document the truth of what happened to rely on the records held by those who operated and funded the schools. Testimony from officials and institutions that operated the schools. Experiments and experiences reported by survivors, their families, communities, and anyone personally affected by the residential school experience. This is great. It puts it in a better, I should say better, it puts it into perspective where everybody can understand from beginning to now what we're trying to achieve. Next. What is reconciliation? Reconciliation. The TRC shows a video that is approximately three minutes long explaining the reconciliation by Murray St. Clair, Senator of the Manitoba Cal. Okay, so Murray St. Clair is a member of the Canadian Senate and First Nations lawyer who served the chairman of the Indigenous Residents of Schools Truth and Reconciliation of 2009 2015. <clears throat> This video is about three minutes long and it explains exactly what it is, how it is, and what, what they did. I can't click on it, but if you do click on it, you, you can view it on yourself and um, it'll, he will explain what, why, and how this, the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission was created and where it is now. Okay, next. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada calls to action. So after he goes through his three minutes uh, explaining how, where, when uh, it was collected and gathered, um, 94 calls to action was gathered from these people, from people, the Indigenous people, the uh, people that were building this together and uh, reaching out to elders and communities and survivors, intergenerational. Um, yes, so these 94 calls to action started and a legacy in child welfare. Um, we started off with one, uh, we call upon the federal, provincial, territory and Aboriginal governments to commit to reduce the number of Aboriginal children in care. They have a specific date that's changing so this is mainly to do with foster care and uh, adoptions and homes, removing them from their homes into non-Aboriginal centers or families. What they request or want is to keep them in the Indigenous families, homes, foster care homes, anything but non-Indigenous. We call upon the federal government to collaborate their provinces and territories to prepare, to prepare and publish annual reports the number of Aboriginal children who are in care compared to non-Aboriginal children. And this again is a huge topic on its own. Being a social worker, you see this a lot. Um, you see a lot of misconceptions of a social worker walking into a uh, not uh, an Indigenous family and uh, they're not they're not familiar with their cultural or their lifestyle or their history or their practices. So when they walk in, they automatically, if they're not familiar, they would be um, prejudiced or um, they're privileged uh, seeing all this. So they, some may feel that they think they're doing a better cause for the child by taking them out of that environment and uh, saving them when the truth is it makes it it is most devastating part for a child to be pulled out of their own home 
so I can go on again with this. It's a very, um, there's a lot of material, there's a lot of examples on how the reports of the Aboriginal children in care are high due to different reasons. Um, okay, next. As I go through this, I'm not gonna read all of the areas. I'll just pull out a few and you can continue on your own to read certain areas. Um, okay, the government are fully implementing Jordan's principle. You, you have to know what Jordan's principle is to understand it, but yes, it should be definitely for each province, all province, not just certain governments, federal or provincial. Um, this area is again is a nice topic on its own. Um, <clears throat> education. We call upon the government of Canada to repeal section 43 of the Criminal Code of Canada. We call upon the federal government to develop Aboriginal groups to join strategy to eliminate educational employment gaps between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. We call upon federal government to eliminate Federal education funding for First Nations children being educated on reserve and those First Nations children being educated off reserve. Um, we call upon the federal government to draft new Aboriginal education legislations. Um, provide a certain amount of, of money to each First Nations depending on the amount of uh, First Nation members and from there they are given a certain amount to allow their student their child to go to school for a certain amount of years certain amount of areas levels of either college or university or a doctor so uh, this whole thing is controlled um, certain First Nations have taken upon themselves to take off to, to take away from that government funding Um, and develop their own, um, which is really good to see. Um, but it's hard because in the First Nations, um, there's a lot of different types of uh, struggles with homes and uh, water and land. So most of those monies would be used to rebuild and, and uh, make their water and land and housing a lot better, more safer than education. Education would be the second or third last on basic survival needs. Okay, next. Okay, language and cultural. We call upon the federal government to acknowledge that Aboriginal rights include Aboriginal language rights. Uh, we call upon the federal government to enact the Aboriginal Life uh, Act the following principles, uh, federal government to point out the Aboriginal Languages Commissioner. Okay, so all this, um, we call upon all levels of government to enable residential school survivors and their families to reclaim names changed by the residential school by way of an administration cost to pay. There's two areas I wanted to bring up on this. The language and the culture, um, bringing up in school for the students, they need to know where they came from, where they were born, where they live, what's their history. So if you take away their language, they won't know. They, they will have a hard time understanding where they came from. So going back to the schools, as far as elementary, this is where the Aboriginal languages should be implemented and allowed to be taught back. And then when we look at the other government and residential school survivors, uh, reclaiming their names, um, there's a lot of names that were changed when they were res when they signed up as status. Um, if they couldn't pronounce the name, my name is Nikoshi, if they couldn't pronounce it or spell it, they would find some name that was close to it, Nakaji, or um, uh, Richard, Rick. There was other names that they changed because they couldn't pronounce it or spell it. So these areas here is where they're still fighting for how uh, the indigenous people are still trying to fight for their change of name, their true name, identity. Okay, <laughs> health. Um, this is a big one. We can't, um, we, we call upon the federal, provincial, ter territory, and Aboriginal governments to acknowledge that the current state of Aboriginal health in Canada is a direct result 
of previous Canadian government policies, including residential schools, and recognize the implementing the health care of the Aboriginal people to identify the international law, constitutional law, and other treaties. So with health care, this is the big one. Um, people are wondering why are Indigenous people the way we, the way we are, the way we live, the way we uh, act, the way we take care of ourselves, the way we... Um, why there's so much of a high suicide rate, um, a high rate of um, abuse, all types of abuse. This whole area, intergenerational trauma for the indigenous youth, child, elders, comes from majority or no, 100 percent of no percentages, but majority of it is from the residential schools and the continuing of the government policies of controlling all indigenous health care. So again, this is a nice or another area that could be expanded onto next. Uh, 1945 investigation and parental complaint for the Gordons Reserve School. Saskatchewan reported that one dinner the children were fed constant were fed consisted of a single slice of bologna potatoes and bread and milk. Next. Um, 19. We call upon the federal government, the Aboriginal people, to establish measurable goals to identify and close the gaps in health out outcomes between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities, as I discussed uh, previously. Um, <clears throat> We call upon federal government to provide sustaining funding for existing and new Aboriginal healing centers to address physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual harms. This is, this is, um, this is a great thing um, to discuss again. Um, a lot of uh, uh, residential, um, a lot of uh, Indigenous uh, treatment centers inside some of the First Nations and outside um, following the uh, different types of uh, of different ceremonies that are held by our elders are taught, are reborn, uh, retaught to the clients uh, or the people that want to learn more of the ceremonies. And there's a whole different um, procedures to each ceremonies from beginning to end. Um, and it does help. It does help the, in, the Indigenous population on uh, different struggles that they are having due to the uh, intergenerational trauma and the residential school. Okay, we call to federal government to provide sustaining funding for existing and new Aboriginal healing centers. Okay, I just went through that. We call governments to increase the number of Aboriginal professionals working in healthcare. Okay, that's another area that's um, part of that, which is great. We call upon medical and nursing schools in Canada to require students to take courses dealing with Aboriginal health issues. This is a big thing, even with social workers, because um, you need to know who, uh, you need to know the cultural history of how the client or the person you're working with has lived, where they came from, what's their history, how did they, why are they where they are, and how did they get there? So. Uh, majority of the Aboriginal health issues, health history, Aboriginal history in general in schools, um, again, it's not all there. They're not all there. So this is a good um, area, again, to bring up. Um, they're starting to bring in, in certain books, materials, university, uh, is teaching with the professors about the history, residential schools, inter-trauma generation. Uh, generation of trauma. So <clears throat> the government is great to recognize this, uh, that we need this um, 
attention being brought into the schools in order for the professionals to understand what's going on. We call upon medical and nursing schools in Canada to require all students to take a course dealing with the Aboriginal health issues, including the history and legacy of the residential schools, the United Nations declarations of the rights of Indigenous practices as I was trying to explain there. <laughs> That's that sums it up. Okay, next. Justice. The federal government to establish a written policy that affirms the independence of the RCMP to investigate crimes in which the government Government has its own interests as potential or real party to civil litigation. To review and amend their respective status set, 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 limitations to ensure that they conform with the principle that government and other entities cannot rely on. Use brought by Aboriginal people. We call upon the Federation of Law Societies of Canada to ensure that lawyers receive appropriate cultural competency training, which includes the history and legacy of the residential school, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of the Indigenous People, Treaties and Aboriginal and Aboriginal Crown Nation. We call upon the parties, and in particular the federal government, to work collaboratively with is not included in the Indian French Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement to have legal issues determined. Excuse me on the agreed to set of its facts. On agreed set of facts. Next. We call upon the federal, provincial, and territory governments to commit to limiting the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in custody over the next decade. Okay. okay this is another area is, is going on right now, and we see that in the news and the news uh, from First Nations to the young trauma. And they move into, they move out of their First Nations into the city for school or for whatever reasons to better themselves and somehow can't make that because of that lack of support, lack of, from the intergenerational trauma, no love was given from their, their previous parents who were survivors of the residential schools. This is a, is a cycle. So these students, these young, and they, they find and they become one of these overrepresentation representation of Aboriginal youth or people in the system. And um, um, yeah, they, they become numbers. So there's different programs that have been created to help the, the youth, uh, especially for the transitions coming in and out of the First Nations. Again, uh, this would be Okay. Um, <clears throat> we call upon the federal government to limiting lodge within the federal correctional system. Yeah, again, that's what the um, institutions within the First Nations and outside where the uh, First Nation uh, Indigenous person can seek for help rather than go their own healing through the lodges within their own First Nations or outside if it's available. Next.
We call upon the federal, provincial, and territorial governments to work with Aboriginal communities to provide culturally relevant services to inmates on issues such as abuse, substance abuse, family and domestic violence, and overcoming the experience of having been sexually abused. Um, call upon the federal government to provide more supports for Aboriginal programming and halfway houses and parole services. Uh, call upon the federal, provincial, territory, and Aboriginal governments to commit to eliminating the overrepresentation of Aboriginal and youth in custody over the next decade. We call upon the federal government to develop national plan to collect and publish data on criminal victimization of Aboriginal people, including data related to homicide and family violence victimization. We call upon levels of government in collaboration with Aboriginal people to create adequately funded and accessible Aboriginal specific victim programs and services with appropriate evaluation mechanisms. Next. Reconciliation. So the Canadian government's UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. We call upon federal, provincial, territory, and municipal governments to fully adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the framework for reconciliation. Um, as you go into that uh, three minute um, slide I recommended, uh, it'll go into detail or more information on that. Uh, we call into the government candidates to develop a national action plan, strategies, and other concrete measures to achieve the goals of the United Nations declarations and rights of Indigenous people. The Royal Proclamation and Covenant of uh, Reconciliation, we call upon the Government of Canada on behalf of all Canadians to jointly develop with Aboriginal peoples a Royal Proclamation of uh, Reconciliation to the issues by the Crown. The proclamation would build on the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and the Treaty of Niagara in 1764. These two are great. The review again is history, it goes further back and reaffirm the nation to nation relation between Aboriginal peoples and the Crown. The proclamation would include but not be limited to the following. And they have a list on its own. Next. Uh, we call upon the federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to liquidate the concepts used to justify European sovereignty over Indigenous peoples and lands, such as the doctrine of the discovery of the terra nullis, and to reform those laws, government policies, and legislation strategies that continue to rely and go on such concepts. This area is again interesting to um, pull out and go dig deeper. It's about the lands, what they consider um, who should get the land, who should and should not receive land, how they base that. Okay, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, we call upon the church parties to a settlement agreement and to all other faith groups and interfaith social justice groups in Canada who have not already done so, to formally adopt and comply with the principles, norms, and standards of the United Nations Declaration for the Right of Indigenous People as a framework for reconciliation. This would include limited, and they have a list. Okay, they would also, we call upon all religious denominations and faith groups who who have not already done so to duplicate to, to concepts used to justify European sovereignty over indigenous lands and peoples. This again, based on the terra nullius, the nullius um, is an area that needs to be looked at in deep for more better understanding of how religion and land are affected. Um, Aboriginal people in the legal system, 
United Nations, the rights of Indigenous people. We come to federal government in collaboration with Aboriginal organizations to fund the establishment of Indigenous laws for development, understanding Indigenous laws and access to justice and accordance to the new cultures of Aboriginal people in Canada. This is starting to be seen or has been practiced, so which is great. Um, by pulling up examples of uh, lawyers, uh, judges, and so forth. It would be a great history on that. Next. All right. Um, National Council for Reconciliation. In, consolation, in cons consultation and collaboration with Aboriginal peoples to enact uh, legislation to establish a national council for reconciliation. The legislation will establish the council as an independent national oversight body with membership joint, jointly appointed by the government of Canada and national Aboriginal organizations. Um, we call upon the levels of government to provide annual reports or any current data requested for the National Council of Reconciliations to report progress. Um, forming response, National Council for Reconciliation by issuing an annual State of Aboriginal Peoples Report. This is ongoing. This is all ongoing research, government, yeah. Next. We call upon federal, provincial, territory, and municipal governments to provide education to public servants on the history of Aboriginal peoples, including the history and legacy of the residential school, the United Nations Declarations of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Treaties and Aboriginal Rights, Indigenous Law, and Aboriginal Crown Relations. This will require skill-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. This sums it all up. This all, this whole number 57 sums it all up. And um, it'd be great just to do this and take it apart and bring it out more. But yes, um, church apologies. We call upon the Pope to issue an apology to survivors, their families, communities, for the Roman Catholic Church's role in the spiritual, cultural, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse of First Nations and Métis children in Catholic one residential school. We call upon the church parties to settle an agreement to develop ongoing education strategies to ensure that their respective congratulations learn, learn about their church's role in colonialization, the history and legacy of the residential school, and why apologies to the former residential school students, their families, and communities were necessary. Next. Education for reconciliation. I would call upon all levels of government to provide public funds to denominational schools to require such schools to provide an educational and comparative religious studies which must include the segment of aboriginal spiritual beliefs and practices developed in collaboration with aboriginal elders this is a big thing too um, i feel that the aboriginal elders um, our is our teachers our knowledge our history our wisdom they should be included in all of the development of text, materials, books, videos, anything with learning, teaching tools for the professors. Um, they know more, they know best, they know every uh, area or have been through it physically, mentally, and spiritually, emotionally. So, yeah. Um, learning that 
shadowing through an Aboriginal elder to go through or to learn of any ceremony is the best way. Okay, youth programs. Uh, we call upon the federal government to establish multi-year funding for community-based youth organizations to deliver programs on reconciliation and establish national network to share information and best practices. <clears throat> uh, acting researcher for Indigenous Contact of Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg looks at a shoe found at Kirk Cross Residential School, which is part of a new exhibit called The Witness Blanket that opened on the eve of the, of the release of the final report by the Truth and Reconciliation. The exhibition runs until June 16th. This would be another interesting topic to, to follow up on, The Witness Blanket. Next. Museum and Archives. We call upon the federal government to provide funding to the Canadian Museum Association to undertake in collaboration with Aboriginal people, Aboriginal people national review of museum policies and best practices to determine the level of compliance in the United Nations declarations of the rights of indigenous people and to make recommendations. We call upon the federal government to provide funding to the Canadian Association of Archives to undertake in collaboration with people, Aboriginal peoples, a national review of archival policies and best practices. And there's a list. Missing children and burial information. We call upon the chief coroners and provincial ballot statistics agencies that have not provided to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada records on the death of Aboriginal children in the care of residential school authorities to make these documents available to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. This is still ongoing. Next. We call upon the federal government to allocate sufficient resources to National Center for Truth and Reconciliation to allow it to develop and maintain the National Residential School Student Death Register established by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Again, this is ongoing. Um, federal government to work with churches, Aboriginal communities, and former residential school students to establish and maintain online registry of residential school cemeteries, including where possible plot maps showing the certain disease, showing the location of deceased residential school children. And that's what I was trying to do in the beginning of all those different reasons why and where and how. In the beginning with the pictures, <laughs> with evidence of um, stories, of survivors. Um, federal government to work with the churches and Aboriginal community leaders to inform the families of children who died in residential schools and children's buried location. And respond to the family's wishes for appropriate comm commemoration ceremonies and markers and reburial in home communities where requested. We call upon the parties engaged in the work of documenting, maintaining, and commemorating and protecting in residential school cemeteries to adopt strategies in accordance with the following, following principles. And the list is provided. Next. We call upon the government of Canada to commit to making funding contribution of 10 million over seven years in the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation amount to assist communities to research, prop, to produce histories, their own residential school experiences and their involvement, truth, healing, reconciliation. There are so many books out there now. There's so many stories, there's so many videos, so many movies that can be used as examples of this. 
um, which is great. And there's more. Um, we call upon the federal government to collaboration with Aboriginal peoples to establish a statutory holiday, a national day of truth and reconciliation to honor survivors, the families, communities, and ensure the public government commemoration of the history and legacy of the residential school remains a vital component of the reconciliation process. As I noted there in the history, they did succeed with this. Um, next. Media and reconciliation. We call upon the federal government to restore increased funding to the CBC, Radio Canada, and Able Canada's national public broadcaster to support reconciliation and be properly reflective of the diverse cultures, language, and perspectives of Aboriginal peoples, including. Yes, this is um, a constant battle with um, the government, uh, the newspaper, the media, the radio, the online, the internet. Um, it's, it's just amazing how people can use and abuse media for their own. Okay, next. Um, next one. Sports and reconciliation. Uh, we call upon the officials to host countries of international supporting events such as Olympics, Pan Am, Commonwealth, Indigenous Peoples, uh, local and indigenous communities are engaged in all aspects of the planning and participating in such events. Um, business and reconciliation. Uh, the corporate sector in Canada to adopt the United Nations Declarations of the Rights of Indigenous People as the reconciliation framework and to apply its principles, norms, and standards to corporate policy and core operational activities involving indigenous people and their lands and resources. Next. Newcomers to Canada, we call the federal government to collaboration with the, in collaboration with the national Aboriginal organizations to revise and the information kit for newcomers to Canada and its citizenship test to reflect a more inclusive history of the diverse Aboriginal peoples of Canada, including the information about the treaties and the history of the residential school. Again, I don't know how much I can state on this, but right now, even in the universities and colleges, they don't have it. They don't have this. They don't have all this information. Um, it's frustrating as a student to see this and uh, or to debate with the professor on how he's teaching it the wrong way and um, situations like that or to um, show workshops or to uh, be part of workshops that are not properly uh, taught because the information is not being given to them in a correct form or the whole truth has not been told. So that's a huge gap that needs to be filled and we call upon the government of Canada to replace the oath of the citizenship of the following. I swear or affirm that I will be faithful and bear a true alliance to the Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs, that I would faithfully observe the laws of Canada, including treaties with Indigenous people, and fulfill my duties as Queen citizenship. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> Um, I know this is not a Q&A section, but if you do have any questions, uh, I'm sure we can provide you uh, an email and you can submit your questions in and I'd be glad to answer them on as come first basis. And again, uh, my name is Sheila Nikishi. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>